Hey, Mr. Starks, how are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you, sir? I am excellent. It's great to have you on the phone today. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about the other time, I, but I, man, hey, I got hung up for God or something. I don't know. Oh, no, uh, that's okay. So it's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, again, it's an honor to be talking with you today, and I won't keep you too long. It's fine. Whatever. Go ahead. I'm fine. Thank you. Well, of course, uh, a big fan of your work and just kind of wondering, you know, how you started playing the drums. You know, what got you into music to begin with? <laughs> Ooh, man. Okay. Maybe uh, the abridged version if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is, as you know, I'm from Mobile and Mardi Gras is there. So we, uh, I used to go to Mardi Gras and we would go, well, that's just a given. So anyway, they, uh. I heard this drummer playing, but I had been taken around not with drums, man, because I couldn't, we didn't afford, couldn't afford drums, but, you know, like beating on the walls or the pots or the pans because I had gotten a, a good scolding a couple of times about hitting pans that I was going to, it was going to cause me a problem with my mother. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, I started, uh, I heard uh, this guy in the high school band, the marching band, and you could hear him when they were coming, and you could hear when he started, and you knew when he stopped. And I was wondering, man, who is that? So when they passed by, I started walking with the band, and I watched them. And from there, it just it, it just struck me, man. I, I feel like the, I like to play like that. I like to be that kind of guy. And I just started just started uh, asking questions, started trying to play, practice, play a little bit, and. Uh, it just started from there, and uh, you know, I was what eighth grade then, and I had said that I was going to play, I was going to be, I wanted to be in that marching band, and uh, when uh, during the summer, after in, in eighth grade during the summer after school, I was going to come freshman, and uh, I went over to rehearse to band practice, and they were out on the field, and I had said then, I said, you know. Uh, Guy asked, I said, well, I'm, I st- I'm starting high school. I'm starting here in September, I said, but I want to be in the band. So the guys, you know, the music, the guys that were playing there, especially the drummer, looked at and said, <laughs> no, freshmen don't make this, this, this band, you know. Sure. And I said, yeah, okay. But you forgot I heard everything that you were doing, and that stuck with me. So I went out to practice, and I made the band. <laughs> But the other hits was the uniform had to be passed down because there was no there was no allowance for new uniforms and you couldn't get a uniform. Okay, who you play? How you play? Until whoever delinquished their uniform and if it fit, you had that uniform. You know. Oh sure. Yeah, and so that's the way, that's the way it happened, man. And uh, I just kept doing it, and then I start listening, and uh, now that was my. Freshman sophomore year, my junior year, I had to go up in up uh, up in what about seventy miles from Mobile. Uh, you got time for me to tell you all of this stuff? <laughs> well, you can say you know as little or as much as you'd like. I'm just kind of getting a sense of you know how it all began for yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I, I left and and I had to go up about seventy miles out of Mobile up up in my mother's home with my grandmother because nobody was there with her. So I was there, and I I went to play in the in the in, in the uh, in the mar- I played the marching band there. Of course, it took four high schools in the in the county, different high schools in the four major cities up there to make one band. Now that's how that one. Okay. And uh, the band instructor, I used to go with him on on the days that he had to go up there to play. Cause see, my classes was ended at uh, eleven o'clock. I was finished with my classes, you know, so that's where it was. But he told me then, E.B. Coleman was the band director. He told me, he said, you can play, you can play a, a swing set, a drum set with with a little dance band. I said, really? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, let's try it. Hey, that's the way we did it. We just took snare drum and tied it to a chair, took the school bass drum, took two soda pop cases, crates and put on each side. I don't know where we found a pedal. Took the uh, cymbals of loose and put one on a stand, and that was it. And from there, it started. And to tell you the truth, my friend, I've never had a, a, an instructor. 
I've never had lessons in my life. I've never had an instructor because during those years, the band directors were were, brand, were either uh, read men for saxophonists or a or, or, or trumpet player, one of the two. They were brass people. They were for the the brass and the, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, the uh, the reed section. There was never a, 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 a instructor for the rhythm. Never, and that's the, and that's the way it happened. So <laughs> that's that was the start of it, you know. Well, I imagine you must have played around uh, Mobile for a while. I'm sure um, you know. Eventually, wound up playing with James Brown. He probably didn't see you in the marching band. I imagine. No, 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 no. I played <laughs> Mobile even after I come out of high school. Sure. I started my uh, my, my my junior my. Uh, Junior college, freshman, sophomore year, junior college. Like, I played all over Mobile. I played, and I played with a couple of groups there. And the major group, after all of the, the other little small, the other little groups that I played with, I played with uh, a group called Castanets. And uh, we played played all the major, all the clubs in Mobile. And uh, we did a lot of the gigs that was up at the college, up at the University of Alabama. And uh, we've just played uh, for the different fraternities, you know. We played them, and uh, but it wasn't with that. My first gig, the, the Bobby Blue Band, was with Gene Parker. They heard me play because they, uh, Duke Peacock Records was going to split those two guys up because each one had a record, had a good record going. Then so they decided which one was going to take what. They wanted the whole band. Uh, they called and asked for the whole band, and nobody wanted to go. And then they come back and say, well, we really were interested in the drummer. You guess he wants to go? That was my yes. Yes, sir. Here I am. <laughs> I'm ready. Excellent. So I packed my little stuff and went to Houston. And now I worked with Bobby Bland for five years. You know, I did all of the recording for him and a lot for Junior Parker. Uh, most of the people that were with Duke Peacock when we were there, when I was there, if they were recording, I, I was doing most of the recording there with them. And uh, during that time, James Brown had, I guess after two, three years with Bobby, he had been, he had heard, heard me play. Uh, yeah, he had heard me play because he came to some of the gigs from what I understand. But, you know, you never knew he was there. Sure. And then he started sending, when we would play different places and he was there, he would send people. Some of his people asked me about playing with him, man. I, but as good as that band was with Bobby Bland, man, well, well as we were going, I, I wasn't going anywhere. But uh, <laughs> he kept asking, and then I, I got married in '60, which remind me, 22nd is my 55th wedding anniversary too. Oh, congratulations! Yes, sir, thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, I got married in '60 with Bobby, Bobby Bland, and then we had our first child in '62, and then all everything started changing. Man, you know, it, it, it wasn't just me, it, my wife and I anymore. I had family. You know, sure. And uh, I uh, all, almost through the whole part of the fifth year I was with Bobby Blair, I had I asked about a raise. And well, I, uh, no, we had gotten a raise, but I asked him. I needed a salary. I needed to know what I was gonna make every week instead, so I knew how much I could get home. You know. So he talked to him, and they said they'll talk about it. So James had already made a statement about you know me coming with him. So then. I asked Bobby once again. I said, well, man, I, 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 I came to do it like this, play by the night. I got to have a salary. Kit, can, you know, they go, can they give me a salary? And he came back and said, well, they said, no, they're not going to be able to do it. I said, okay. So James, had, in the meantime, James called back, and I talked to him. I said, yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, we can talk about me playing with you. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, whatever they're paying you, I'll double that. And you don't have to pay, you know, I'll pay, I'll, I'll double that. And uh, you won't have to worry about no uniform. You won't have to worry about it. I'll put double what they're doing. And we'll talk about whatever else needs to be done. I said, well, wait a minute, oh, man. And then, you know, I padded. <laughs> I padded what I was making. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that took me some time. Thinking, yeah, you know what I mean? Got to do what you got to do. Man, I, I told hey, there you be. I told him, I said, well, you know, I let him know what I, what I, what I was making. I, and I, like I said, I upped it. And he said, that, no problem. I'll double that. Then I, I talked to my wife. I said, hey, I got a chance to get a salary, double what I'm making. And I told her what the price would be. She said, well, honey, 
you know about that stuff. You know about the music. I don't know about that. You know what we have to do. I said, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to see well, whatever you do, we'll do it. I'm with you. I said, all right. So I called him back and told him, hey, we got, we got a little deal going. So he told me, I said, but I got to give a two-week notice. I just can't walk away like that. He said, okay. So I wrote my notice out, and uh, I finished my notice because Bobby told me right off the bat, he said, you know how I feel about you. He said, but you, you got a family and it's business. I can understand. He said, I'm sorry we couldn't keep you. I said, well, it's good. James said, I sent me a ticket. I, about two weeks, he said, sent me a ticket. I met him in New York, and that's where that started. Yeah, that's awesome. And, of course, the music you guys were making around that time was incredible. Was it kind of tough to deal with James behind the scenes? You always kind of hear that, you know, maybe after no. you made all that money, but was it uh, a little different, you know, when you had to kind of deal with uh, him running the shots? No, sir. Uh, you have to understand my teaching growing up. Like I, I was taught, you know, my dad taught me and said, hey, if you got a job, you do your job the best you can. It's not your job. You don't own you working for somebody. And you do that. You work for them. You do what they tell you to do. It's fine with me. See, because uh, when, when I got with James, before we, we sat down and he gave me all of, told me all of the things that he wanted, how he wanted it done. And then I'm face to face with him. I told him right up front. I said, in the first place, the other thing is you understand this with me. I don't pay fines. And he looked at me kind of strange, like, why? I said, because there's a reason for me not paying fine. I work for you. I don't own this 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 this, this gig. This is your gig. I said, I, I, you tell me what you want me to do, and I play it the best way I can. How you want me to do it? Your rules, I understand that. And I and and I'm working for you. I said, now, if you take anything from me, you're not taking it from me. You're taking it from my family, and I don't play that. I don't, you, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to let anybody do anything, take anything from my family because, you know, that when you do that for me, then I'm going to take two or three times that much back from you. I said, that's the way I, that's the way I look at it. And I said, but as long as I'm working here, I'll do exactly what you tell me, the way you ask me to do it. And I said, uh, when I see I can't do it, I say, hey, I'm going, bye. He looked at me and said, you know one thing, I appreciate that, you all man. And I never, I never paid a fine with James. I never had a problem with it, man. Okay. The thing of it is, that you never, if you're working for somebody, you got to understand that you're working for them. It's not, if it's your gig, then you can make, you can make all the decisions. Right. But if it's not your gig, hey, man, do like they ask you. And if you don't like that, you got the privilege of walking away from it. That's the way I see it. And, and everything that he had. He told you right off the bat, you know. He he would he would tell you right off the bat. He told you whatever you had to do had to do. It wasn't that complicated, you know. You, it it wasn't that complicated. I put it that way. Not to me, it wasn't. He told you what he wanted, how he wanted it, and he paid he paid you to do that. Yes, but that, that I never had a problem with him. I never did because I never paid a fine. Sure, well, I want to get uh, your sense as to. Um you know, the writing process or the recording process, was there a lot of that that went on ahead of time, or did you guys just a lot of times just hit record and see what happened? No, no. Uh, a lot of times there were. <laughs> James changed everything he was doing almost every time he rehearsed. He, and, and if you notice, a lot of the stuff that he re recorded was re-recorded. Sure. And he had a way, he, 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 he came up with ideas how he wanted to do it. And now, if, uh, so far as the recording, he was the, <laughs> I called it the boss. He was the boss of King Records when he was there. Because if James was in Cincinnati at King Records, nobody did anything during the entire time he was there except him. He would go in that studio, you would go in there. Oh man, and rehearse over and 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 over the stuff that that uh that you were doing at night. And he changed certain little parts of it, but you were still doing it. And if he when he wanted to record, nobody did. That's what he did. He recorded right there because when they were recording in the studio in the studio at King Records, you cut the you do the tape. They're taking back and back at the record during while they were pressing the records. And they pressed, they pressed the records and stuff back in the back of, of King Records. Oh, sure. 
and, and you know, so so that's the way he did that. And then after King Records, after he stopped, I think during the recording at King Records, then he started doing. He went to I think after King Records was shutting down or whatever, however you call it. Then he started going up. He started doing stuff in New York. They called Polydor. He went with Polydor after King Records. And then if you recorded, you were recording in New York, you know. Right. And then when he had the days off, that's what he did tell you right off the bat. They have a rehearsal such such and such time. So that means you couldn't take off and go home if you had three days off. You had to be there for the rehearsal on the second day. <laughs> I don't know. So that's, that's one of them things, man. Sure. Well, and I know you kind of had an interesting situation where you were playing alongside Clyde Stubblefield, you guys kind of traded off. What, what was that relationship like, and you know, how did you guys decide, you know, who played on what track? Uh, you forgot. You still haven't paid. You have missed a, you know, you play for James Brown. He decide everything. Okay. <laughs> and his gig. So now, what we were done, but when I joined the group, man, when I got to New York, there were five drummers on stage, man. Wow. There were five drummers there, man, and I, because I, uh, I asked him, you know, you got five guys up there. What am I? Why am I here? And he said, "Don't worry about that, because the the the, the first drummer with James was was Melvin Parker. That was the lead. And I put out the first drummer. He was the lead drummer when I got there. Maceo's brother. And uh, he he left not too long after I got there, cause he went into he went into the army. And then that moved uh, a guy named uh, Obi Williams. He moved to that spot where Melvin had, but then again, I was moving. He was moving me closer because some of the drummers would leave. He was letting them go, you know. So it got to the point. It got to be Obi William, myself. Got to be three of us because he had basically not too long after he hired Clyde. So after that, Obi was moved. Period, because I think he he was. Married, look, yeah, that was dancing or something happened, but he wasn't playing the way Jane wanted to be played. So I moved to that first chair, and then Clyde and I what got was next to me. So it was just two of us, Clyde and I, and we never had a problem. But see, James said who was going to play what, but you had to know the entire show. You had to know his entire show because if he was singing, if he was doing his his his, his, his uh, if he was in front doing his doing his job. If he wanted to hear Clyde play a certain way, he'd point back at Clyde. I'd stop and Clyde would take it. If Clyde had started playing it, he didn't want to hear it that way, he'd point back to me. So it was just that it's just a trade-off. He did the way he did it, you know. Yeah, you'd have to be pretty tight then to pull all that off for sure. <laughs> yeah, and you had to pay attention. So you couldn't take your eyes off him when he came on stage. Because if he caught you, if he had a glimpse that you weren't looking, he would do something, and then he looked. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but that was that was the way it was done. You know, it was certain things. Uh, certain things the way Clyde played them that he would play them. But then I could play, I could play that funk the way Clyde. I could play the funk, but I could play. I could not play that the way Clyde played. I knew she, and Clyde couldn't play the way that I was playing. Right. Well, we could play each each one of us could play the tune that we would do, that James was doing. You know, you just had to do that. You had to know. You had to be able to do it, and that's and that's what that's what we did. That's the way it happened. It was never a problem because even when Clyde left the band, when he left, we were going overseas, and he came back in the plane after we got off. Because I thought sure Clyde would have told me, say, "Hey, Jab, you got it." And I looked and said, "Got what?" Say, "Oh, Clyde didn't make it." I said, "Oh man." But that's, that was the way that happened. Yes, sir, that was one way of it. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, you guys made so much uh, important music around that time. And, you know, later on, the hip-hop artists were sampling stuff. And, you know, mostly just your drum beats really kind of created that whole, you know, musical genre really down the road. I mean, what do you feel about that? Uh, you feel pretty good about somebody using that you've done something that somebody thought enough of to use, if you understand what I'm saying. Right. But then again, I still say this. You know, I'm old school, and I still think you give respect to people that you give your respect in order to get respect. And if they, they use, like, just as you said, they use the hip hop artists, used all our beats, and you can still, they're still doing it. You hear it. You can just, see, you know, you're playing 
and Clyde, we know our plan, but you hear it. But they don't even, they are not, they are, they are not, uh, I figure, men enough, or the company is not business enough to come back and say, well, hey, we used this, this was yours, we used this to, and, and on our record. But, uh, and we appreciate it, even if you don't do anything but say thank you. You make all of the money. But you don't even say, well, here's here's something for what you would for using your part. But thank you for that for us for our using it. They don't even give you that respect, you know. And they right. come up like well, that's that that's our stuff. No, it's not. But I think that's a disrespect. But then then again, hey man, you know I'm not angry with you. You know if that's what you want to do, you do that. But I do know that that you have uh that you that you have you have misused. I was, well, you've used it and haven't even said, well, thank you. That, you know, that's what I'm, that's all I'm saying, you know, because they've done it so much, man, and, 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 and they don't even they don't even give you the respect of saying, well, this was, we took this from Jabbo or from Clyde. They, these are the two drummers that we use this from. They don't even say that. I guess they figure they may, somebody may, may have to pay something for it or something. Right. But you should. It's not. It's ours. It's not yours. And that's stealing. That's what I call it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, that's what I call it. I, I mean, you know. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm not angry. No, I don't. Get, I don't have time to get angry. I just look at it because I feel this way, man. What's for me, I'm gonna get it. If the good Lord, if, if the good Lord to give it to me, I, I'm gonna get it anyway, regardless of what you do. But I still say there's a certain amount of respect that you should give. An artist, you know, if you're out there and you're out there and that's you've created this or this is what you've done, I still think it, you should be thanked. That you should get compensated for it. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it is too bad that it worked out that way. But you know, on the flip side of that, it seems like your influence it can be heard in, in basically everything that you hear nowadays. So, I mean, maybe you can take uh, at least some, some comfort in that. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, you know, hey, like I say, I'm appreciative. Of all of all the stuff, of all the things that has been said or done, I'm appreciative of it. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I was blessed to be able to do it. But I tell you what, I am not angry. I don't have time to be that way. And uh, I tell my, I t- tell my children, but tell my grandson, my grandchildren. You know, when you hear it, and I'm trying to put some stuff down so that they will know that that's Papa playing or that's Daddy playing. But that's that's my plan, and they know that. And I say, well, that's all right. Let them say what they want to say. You can't deny what I'm doing because it was done on. That's the way love goes with Janet Jackson. That was that. That goes to show you too. But it's all good, man. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, that's a, probably the best attitude to have. And you know, of course, I know that you've been uh, pretty close with some of the JBs uh, over the years, and have played with Clyde, obviously, and uh, you know, did stuff with Fred Wesley and uh, Bootsy Collins. So. Are you uh, still playing around now, or do you have anything that you're working on? Oh, man, I play. <laughs> I'm playing five nights a week. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. This is my 18th year. Now, I'm in Florida. I'm playing in Florida. I still live in Mobile, but I'm down in. I'm between Sandestin, Florida, and Panama City Beach. And this is my 18th year down here. I'm at a place in Grayton Beach they call the Red Bar, Piccolo Restaurant Red Bar. This is my, this is my 18th year there. And uh, Clyde and I still do some things because you talk to Kathy, she still books some things for us if we are necessary. The last European and Japan trip I did was a, supposed to have been a James Brown tribute to her. I did with Boots and Collins. Uh, I've done some things with Fred. Fred, we went, went up to San Francisco and did some things with Fred West. And then Fred, if he's out on this end, he'll come in and sit in and play with us down here, play with me down here. Clyde has never been. Well, he was here because I had booked him down here. This was a few years ago, but Fred will come through periodically and spend a couple of days with me and play. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. I am I wish if it was a little closer to us here in the Midwest, but uh, I'd love to see you guys someday. Where, where are you? We're, we're in Minnesota here, so it's a bit of a trek. <laughs> yeah, but you're not too far from Clyde, though. No, I think he's in over in Wisconsin, right? He's in, he's in Madison. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, man. But hey, man, it <laughs> have to come when the weather's not it's not bad over there on your end, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but maybe one maybe one of these times we'll get to get over on that end some way, sometime. You know, we we get to come over there, maybe. 
Yeah, excellent. Well, again, Jabal, it's been an honor talking with you today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking on the you thinking enough, thinking enough of it to have the interview. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much, and have a good and blessed day. Now, take care. All right, you too. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye now.